So we have no less for, than four speakers, as I said. Uh, so we'll we'll I'll spend shorter time than usual on introducing each and every one of them. But uh, they are uh, Anastasios Lekos, or Tassos, as we know him as colleagues. Uh, Tassos is an associate professor at the Department of Cybernetics at NTNU, and his main research interests are robotics and AI. We have Inga Strimke, who is a postdoc at the cybernetics department. Um, she's got a, a PhD from the University of Bergen, uh, and her main research interests are explainable AI, fittingly enough. And then we have uh, Wilde Jarum and Sindre Reman, both PhD students uh, at the Department of Cybernetics here at NTNU. And first out is uh, Tassos. So Tassos, I hand it over to you. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for being here to our, to our webinar. Um, as Stream said, my name is Tassos Lekas, and I work with Autonomous Systems, Robotics, and AI at the Department of Engineering and Cybernetics here at NTNU. I am the first presentation of four, so I'm not allowed to say anything more. I will go straight to the topic. And uh, first, I would like to say a few things about the, the motivation. Why, why are we doing this? Why are we bothering with artificial intelligence? Now, we will start with the basics. Uh, as we know, the last year's artificial intelligence AI systems are becoming ubiquitous and disruptive to many industries. And there is uh, certain studies that indicate that by 2030, uh, AI could contribute to the global economy with 13.3 uh, trillion euro, which is a very large number. And uh, interestingly enough, although AI is a large field, uh, all these uh, kind of uh, new developments are attributed, or most of them, to one branch of AI, uh, deep learning, which has helped achieve state-of-the-art performance in tasks that were traditionally uh, challenging for machines. And this is beginning to change now. Uh, interestingly enough, although AI has been a topic of interest to academia for many years, the impact on, on industry and business has not been that high. Uh, comparatively to what is happening now. Uh, this can be seen by uh, looking into some patent analytics. For instance, since the 50s, there have been 340,000 applications for AI-related inventions, and more than half of them were uh, done between 2013 and 19. And the ratio of scientific papers to inventions decreased from 8 to 1 in 3 to 1, which is a very interesting indicator as well. The, the sectors and industries that are at the forefront of this change are telecommunications, with 15% transportation and life and medical sciences. So we see that something is beginning to change, not only from a research point of view, but also a business point of view. The main elements for this success have been the, uh, all this uh, focus on big data and computational power. We have much more of both of these than we ever had during the last years. But at the same time, uh, we have uh, had a lot of uh, developments uh, regarding methods that are exploiting all this power and, and, and the methods and the data, I'm sorry. Uh, at the same time, we have cloud computing, which provides a platform for digitalization. So it seems that all the right things are coming together uh, the last years. But uh, it has not only been success and um, uh, progress, uh, there is many challenges that need to be uh, addressed at the moment. The first one is the lack of transparency. Since deep learning most involves deep neural networks, which is the black box you see on the, on the right side, uh, although we can see everything in them, uh, there is no semantics we can assign to it, and uh, it's not useful information, not intuitive. It is useful, but not intuitive. Uh, this is in contrast with uh, past models in machine learning, like uh, decision trees, which are transparent, and every decision at the end of the tree, in this case here, can be traced back, um, and we can see uh, why this particular decision was made. So at the moment, we have lack of transparency. Lack of robustness is another big problem. And there is a classical example here with the first uh, picture uh, being identified as a panda with uh, kind of approximately 60% confidence. But by adding some random noise uh, on the picture, although it doesn't make any difference for us, is the, the resulting picture is the one on the right. Uh, the system now thinks this is a given with 99.3% confidence, per, uh, confidence. This is, of course, terrible. And it shows a certain, like a, a lot of fragility uh, in, the, in the system. And of course, we have bias which is one of the biggest problems. Um, here we, we see a picture of a wolf, uh, which is identified correctly as a wolf, but, it's, but when the system is explaining why it's doing that, it's not because of the actual wolf, but because of the snow. Because when the model was trained, most of the pictures that included the wolf 
also included snow. So the system is not able to uh, distinguish between the two. So we get the right answers, but for their own reasons. And these problems together uh, make it very difficult to implement uh, or to use deep learning in uh, business critical applications, especially where safety might be an issue. Now, this uh, topic has been discussed a lot, and there is a number of high-level references, and I don't have time to go through them in detail, but I'm mentioning them because they're interesting. We have DARPA in the US who are uh, suggesting a new framework for uh, AI methods where we will have the accuracy of the recent and, and per good performance of the recent database uh, methods together with the explainability of the older methods, hopefully. And they have an explainable AI program on this. At the same time, we have the EU documents, uh, ethic guidelines for trustworthy AI. It has some very interesting details there and how explainable AI could be mission oriented. And of course, we have GDPR, which uh, doesn't allow to uh, take individual decision making, uh, being totally automated without providing explanations to the individual. So how can explainable AI help? It can contribute in four ways, mostly. The first one is when we have an XAI model or a kind of an AI model, to be able to verify the model. Does it work correct? Does it work correctly for the, for, for the right reasons or not? Then we can detect problems with biased data sets and if there is correlation versus causation problems. By identifying these problems, uh, we can build methodologies to improve the model. So we can understand the weaknesses, then we can address them. That is kind of straightforward, although not straightforward to, to do. Uh, on certain applications, we can learn from the model. Usually, we are used to provide the, the model uh, information and teach it to do things. But there is applications such as chess or AlphaGo, where actually the neural network played with itself and uh, it went way beyond to what humans could do before. And now humans are taking advice from such systems about how to play those games. And of course, by doing all that, we have a good understanding and we can be compliant to legislation. Now, at NTMU, by recognizing all these uh, uh, issues, challenges, and opportunities at the uh, AI Lab, all the partners agreed to build a project on this, uh, on this topic, which I have the pleasure to coordinate. So our project is called Exigon, and it started in 2020, and it will run up to 24. We have a budget of 16 million kroner, but our actual budget is quite higher because we have gotten some gift positions by our departments and uh, uh, Department of Cybernetics and the Co Department of Computer Science and the faculty, uh, EA faculty, to whom we are very uh, grateful for all this help, all these three. And uh, the research partners is our NTNU and Center of Digital. But more importantly, we have industry collaborators, then BED, TNV, without the GL anymore, and Braun, Equinor, Kongsberg, Telenor, Tronter Energy, uh, who have committed to provide use cases, models, data, and expert knowledge. So this will not be a, a study, theoretical study, but we will try to see how these methods can be actually implemented on real systems, which we think makes a difference. And we have some very good international partners in Australia and the US. Now the progress so far, uh, we started with a slow hiring process uh, during Corona, but now people are coming on board. Uh, but we have been uh, lucky enough to have already graduated 16 master students on like really interesting topics with uh, some very interesting results. And we have a six or seven, at least uh, new ones that are uh, kind of doing their thesis right now. And uh, we have worked on a variety of applications, so robotic manipulation, um, marine vehicles, and, um, and others. Here is a very biased uh, presentation of what my students have been doing, I must say. And I would like to say a few things about the people involved in the project, because you might know some of them or you might want to take contact with some of them. So I think that's important. Helge Langset is uh, one of the key people and he's at the Department of Computer Science working with Tipa Asian Networks. Adil Rashid, he's at uh, Cybernetics, same department as me, working with hybrid modeling, merging differential equations with uh, database models. Eric Monteiro is a very uh, uh, kind of important connecting point for all of us, because it's about how to get these methods to the, IT, to the organizations, how do they make sense to the end users? And they're not just made for developers. So he's focusing on that. And me, uh, I'm the coordinator. I work with robotics, AI. And for today, I have this uh, general uh, uh, blah, blah, kind of uh, before the real people with uh, the people with the real contributions uh, enter the, the webinar. Uh, Kerstin Bach is also affiliated and she will coordinate, uh, she will supervise a PhD student. Then we have Inga Strumke, who is our postdoc, and she's doing an amazing job between 
those of us in the kind of a higher uh, level, if I might say, and of course the PhD students. And then we have uh, Sindre, and, and today uh, Inga will give a presentation of uh, intro to XAI. Sindre, my PhD student, will talk about deep reinforcement learning and a particular method, supply values on robotic manipulation. Man manipulation. And Vilde Jarum, as is also my PhD student and working with approximating deep neural networks using more transparent approaches and how this can be done for real time explanations. So that's all for me and enjoy the rest. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, let me explain to you how this engine works. No, relax, I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that. But if you can tell me now what you expected when I said that I was going to explain something to you, then, you know, write that down and send me an email and we can publish together. Um, because we can't even really agree on what a good explanation of something is. Uh, and that is today's problem, right? But I just want to kind of be sure that we all start on the same footing. So I'm going to give you a three second crash course in, in machine learning. Okay. So machine learning is that thing that happens when you have data and an objective and make a computer solve it. And if you have never done it before, but would like to do it, you can actually do it in Excel like this. You can write in X and Y values. That's your data. You can say my objective is to draw a straight line and Excel can do that for you with its computing power. And then you've actually done machine learning, right? Because it's, it's those three ingredients, data, uh, objective and computing power. And then the computer has to use its power to adjust parameter values. Straight line has two parameters, right? Um, and what comes out is a machine learning model. Isn't it awesome? Now, the problem is, of course, that not all problems that we have in the world can be solved with straight lines. So then we need to use those thingies that uh, Tassos also mentioned, the deeper networks that can, you know, drive cars and be racist and uh, tell uh, the difference between cats and dogs and everything. But it really boils down to the same principle, the same underlying principle as with the straight line. What they do is that they use data uh, to achieve an objective or solve a problem by adjusting their little parameters. The issue with neural networks or deep neural networks is that they have a lot of parameters, right? So it's not that these parameters are a secret, it's that there are so many of them that we really struggle with getting an intuition for them. Now, another way that we can think about machine learning models that have learned from data is kind of, I think, like artificial uh, intuition, because when we learn from experience, what we develop isn't reason, right? It's intuition. And um, kind of, do you think that you are able to explain your intuition to somebody? Like, well, probably not. So when we're trying to do modern XAI, we're actually trying to explain artificial intuition. Just a bit weird to think about, right? Um, and there are several kind of problems or challenges with this. One thing is that we use machine learning when we have to model phenomena that are very nonlinear and complex. And when we want explanations, we want something linear and intuitive. Okay, so we're kind of asking for a linear version of a highly nonlinear phenomenon, which is just unreasonable or, or, or self-contradictory. So let's try to keep that in mind when we're, when we're asking for explanations. Um, the other challenge is that testing, which has often been the traditional approach to understanding something, is not enough in high dimensional problems because of the curse of dimensionality. And I don't have time to talk about the curse of dimensionality now, but I will gladly come back and do it. Um, but this here is, is an example of how bad the curse of dim dimensionality can be. You can have a module that can recognize stop signs and then find a particular way which is called an adversarial example, right? Find a particular way to put stickers on it, to confuse it so that it thinks that it's actually looking at a speed limit sign. It's the same thing it was as with the panda that Tassos showed us earlier. Um, and the issue is not that we cannot solve this weakness here. The issue is that we would never think of testing exactly this combination of squares or, or the noise from earlier, right? So it's impossible in practice to, to test all possible scenarios. That's the curse of dimensionality. Finally, as I said in the beginning, explanation, that term isn't well defined. Different people in different roles require different explanations. I, when I program, want a different explanation than a doctor just using a machine learning model as a tool. Um, it's not clear legally what legislations actually require when they say that you have to explain something to somebody. Like in the GDPR, we don't even know what the GDPR wants us to do when we explain stuff. And also this field of XAI is very dynamic and it's full of methods. Um, and I can show you uh, a small overview. 
looks like that's horrible, isn't it? And I think that maybe if you're an engineer and you look at this map, then you go, ooh, nice, it's a modern field with a lot of methods. They have probably addressed a lot of problems. Um, but uh, I would actually uh, argue that the opposite is the... Um, uh, is the truth. There are many methods in explainability out there, but there are no benchmarks, no common, uh, no common principles underlying them. Very often there is nothing unifying different methods, and you kind of have to pick a method that fits exactly your problem um, and your area also, because different areas may have different requirements to explanations. Um, and it might not even be possible to unify all the methods into one thing, which is explainable AI. Um, but instead of kind of trying to explain all these methods to you uh, and convince you that there is chaos here, I'm going to try the opposite. I'm going to try to convince you that explainable AI actually just boils down to two or three different approaches. And the way I'm going to do that is say, OK, imagine that a fabulous black box falls from the sky. It has a ribbon on it because it's fantastic. It can solve our problems. Uh, and what this box does is that it takes in information and then it does its a secret kind of uninterpretable crunchy and outcome predictions. Now, society would probably be very happy for such a box, but scientists would rather say, mm, well, how does the black box do this? How, do, how does it convert information to predictions? Um, and then there are basically just two approaches right the scientists can take uh, to find out what the black box, black box uh, does it can or she the scientist can poke the box systematically and see what happens see how the predictions change when the information that goes in changes um, or she can take a big hammer and smash the box into a thousand pieces and look inside okay and the and the, and the, the adult words for these two kinds of explanations that which she would arrive at are extrinsic explanations that what you get that's what you get when you poke the box from the outside and intrinsic explanations that's what you get when you try to explain the box by looking inside and we're going to look at both these uh, explanation types today christmas has arrived early Cindy is going to tell us about extrinsic and build about intrinsic explanations um, but before uh, I let Sindra, who will talk after me, continue. I'm going to warm you up a bit to what Sindra is going to talk about. So I'm going to tell you about one specific extrinsic explanation method, which is called SHAP. Some of you may have heard of it. It's based on this thing called the Shapley value, which is a solution concept from game theory. And SHAP is not short for Shapley, okay? It's important to know because it's embarrassing when people think that SHAP is short for Shapley. Okay, anyway, the Shapley decomposition is this... Uh, equation that I have been told is ugly, and I unfortunately won't have time to tell you all the details of this uh, equation, but I'll happily come back and do that also. Um, but intuitively, we can understand what's going on when you calculate the Shapley value. So imagine that you're out on the town with two friends and you want to share uh, a cab home, but you're, you live in different places, so you go different distances with the cab. Then the question is, how much should each of the passengers in the cab pay for, the, for, for their piece of the ride. Now this can of course uh, give rise to many uh, uh, arguments and discussions, but the Shapley decomposition tells you a way to calculate exactly how much each should pay in a way that nobody has anything to complain about. Um, and what you have to do if you want to calculate the Shapley value is that you have to calculate the value of each coalition or each group that you three friends uh, entering the cab as passengers can form. So you have to know how far the first one will go, how, how much the first one will pay, uh, how much the second one would have to pay if uh, he or she went alone, how much the third one would have to pay. And then you have to take also all sub collisions of these guys. So you would have to take passenger one and two, one and three, two and three, one, two, three. So you would have to consider all the different collisions um, and, and their values. So how much each collision here would have to pay, you would stuff them into this equation. I don't know if you can see my pointer. And then you would calculate like that systematically the value of adding and removing every single player. So this is computationally heavy, but what would come out then is the Shapley value, meaning the number that each person would have to pay to go uh, with the taxi. Uh, now, if you want, you can uh, take a screenshot quickly of the slide here, but because this is how the calculation is done. So I can tell you, if you each of you are going three, seven, and 10 kilometers, 
the fair price that each of you would have to pay is one, three, and six kilometers. And there's something magical going on here, is that one, three, and six all add up to 10. So each of your contributions, which are lower than if you had gone alone, would still sum up to the total uh, cab ride. So not even the, the driver would have a reason to complain. Okay, so the Chapter decomposition is really one of the gems from cooperative uh, game theory. And um, it was introduced in 53 and received uh, Lloyd Shapley, the guy who, uh, who introduced it, received the Nobel Prize in economics for it in 2012. So this, this is really a gem. And it has also become super popular in XAI. And the way that you use the Shapley value and uh, take it from, from game theory to uh, machine learning is that you say that, okay, I stop talking about passengers and cabs or players, I start talking about data features. And I stop talking about prizes or outcomes of games, I instead talk about machine learning model. And then what you would get out is Shepley value that earlier told us how much each passenger had to pay would then become what we call a feature attribution, which would tell you how important each feature is for the machine learning model. Um, which is one way to explain a machine learning model is to say that this is important information for the model and this is not so important information for the model and um, and um, and as such arrive at an ordering of the different features that the model uses. Now, one challenge that anybody here who has ever trained a machine learning model can now probably think of is that you can't just take a machine learning model and give it a subset of the features that it was trained on, right? You would get an error message from TensorFlow or something involving shapes of number arrays. Um, so how, how to overcome that kind of, and this is where this Shep library that I mentioned earlier comes in, because what it does is that it doesn't actually remove features, it approximates the output of a model uh, given that you have excluded some feature. Now the original Shep, uh, library was introduced in 2017. And back then when they uh, simulated absence of features, they just assumed that all the features were independent, right? So I dropped some feature and I sampled the other features, the remaining features in, in the, um, oh, sorry, the dropped features from some background data set. I just sampled that. And I don't care about, or I don't um, take into account what the values of the included features are. Uh, then came a, came a guy from Norsk Regne Central, actually, Ås Løland et al, saying that you can't assume feature independence when you do machine learning, that's a bit rich. So they introduced conditional SHAP, which became an R library and is also now in the Python library of SHAP, um, that takes into account that features can be dependent. Um, but it gets even better than that. Last year at NeurIPS, this thing called causal SHAP was introduced. And that doesn't only take into account that different features uh, are dependent of each other, but also that they can have a causal hierarchy. So you, knowing the problem, you can go in uh, to causal SHAP and say that I know that this variable causes this one, causes this one, meaning that when you remove variables, SHAP actually takes into account what the removal of a variable can do to the data at all. Um, now, most developers of, uh, of such models are often statisticians, uh, meaning that they write in R. So causal SHAP was for a very long time only available in R, uh, which we thought that's not good enough. So what we did in the marvelous year of 2021 is, I'm saying we actually mean Sindra, took the causal SHAP code for R and the NeurIPS paper and said, we're going to write this in Python, which did. And then he uh, studied how well causal SHAP worked on his robotic manipulator, which he had also uh, implemented in Python. Um, and this is where I give the word over to uh, Sindra so that he can tell us more about that causal SHAP package he wrote and how it worked. Uh, my name is uh, Sindre Reman, and I'm a PhD candidate uh, at the Department of Engineering Cybernetics here at NTNU. Uh, and this uh, part of the webinar is based on, on a paper uh, submitted to the Nordic Machine Intelligence Journal with uh, Inga and Tassos as uh, co-authors. And uh, first, I'll uh, describe the problem that we're solving in this uh, presentation. Uh, we want to use an uh, explainable AI method called uh, causal SHAP, uh, which, 
to explain how a deep reinforcement learning agent uses this uh, robotic manipulator, the Open Manipulator X by Robotis, uh, to manipulate this lever from a randomly selected start angle to a randomly selected goal angle. And uh, the deep reinforcement learning agent was uh, first trained in simulated environments, then transferred to the real world. And uh, finally, we use causal shap to explain the behavior of the agent when it operates in the real world. And uh, with the real world, I mean my home office. And uh, now I'll describe the deep reinforcement learning part of the solution. Uh, reinforcement learning is one of the three main paradigms within machine learning. And uh, deep reinforcement learning is a variant of reinforcement learning that uses neural networks as the function approximator. And the operation in, the, in reinforcement learning can be visualized by this uh, figure. And uh, the two main components are the agent and uh, the environment. And the agent consists of a reinforcement learning algorithm and a policy. And the environment is everything that can be influenced by the agent. Okay, so the loop, it functions in a loop and the loop uh, starts with the agent observing a state uh, from the environment and then subsequently choosing an action uh, based on this state and the, the policy of the agent. And the ac action chosen by the agent is then reflected in the environment and uh, the, action, the agent uh, uh, then observes a new state and a reward uh, from the environment. And uh, the reward should ideally function as an indication of how good the agent is performing. And uh, the reinforcement learning algorithm uh, is then used, uh, uses then all the information uh, to update the agent's policy and to ideally receive better rewards in the future. Um, so now we will look uh, specifically at our problem and we will start with the states uh, and uh, we use the joint positions of the manipulator. We use a Cartesian vector from the end effector to the base of the lever. And we use the current lever angle and the goal lever angle. Um, and then we'll look at the reward function. Uh, the reward function gives a reward of zero uh, when the absolute difference between the achieved lever angle and the goal lever angle is less than 1 40th of a radian, and it gives a reward of minus one otherwise. And then now we look at the actions. Uh, we have four actions, the first of which is a rotation about the shoulder joint. The second action is a rotation uh, around the elbow joint. The third action is a rotation around the wrist joint. And the final action is whether the gripper should be opened or closed. With a negative value indicating uh, that the gripper should be closed and that it should be open otherwise. And since uh, deep reinforcement learning uses neural networks, which are black boxes, it is next to impossible for a human to understand how they make their decision. Therefore, we aim to use uh, explainable AI to look inside the black box. And uh, now we look at the causal shap part of the solution. And uh, as Inga said, uh, causal shap uh, builds upon the popular explainable AI method called uh, shap. And uh, they're both uh, additive feature attribution methods, which means that they take the output of the model and distribute it among the inputs to the model. And these uh, distributed values are called SHAP values or causal SHAP values in the case of uh, causal SHAP. And uh, to say it simply, they represent how much of the output that each input feature was responsible for. And look to the slide for an example with a plain black box. We just know the values of the input and uh, the values of the output. But with SHAP values, you can see which parts of the input that were most important for the output and how the inputs work together to or process together to uh, arrive at the output of the black box. And uh, what is special about causal SHAP is that the sampling procedure is altered to take account for indirect effects in addition to the direct effects that are already captured by the normal version of SHAP. And uh, the sampling procedure is altered by taking the causal structure of the data into account 
and we specify the causal structure using a partial causal ordering. And by including indirect effects in the explanations, we can get a more complete picture of the importance of each feature on the output of the black box. And here we have four different causal models and the solid arrows uh, represent direct effects and the dotted lines represents possible indirect effects. For instance, here X1 can have an indirect effect on Y by influencing X2. And uh, here we can see a figure that represents the causal ordering uh, that is used for the explanations uh, that I'll show you later in this uh, part of the webinar. Uh, Compared to the previous slide, we can see that this uh, ordering is specified using only chains, which means that this is a direct acyclic graph, uh, a DAG. And uh, this causal ordering uh, reveals weakness with the causal chap implementation, namely that we're unable to specify that features should be independent. For instance, uh, theta target, uh, which is the goal angle of the lever, uh, it's in fact an independent feature. However, because of the way that the implementation works, we have to put it somewhere in the causal ordering and we put it at the top, expecting that the causal chap algorithm will uncover that this feature only has a direct, direct effect and not indirect through other features. And the further work will involve altering this Im implementation to account for indirect uh, features. And uh, now, We'll look at the results describing the shaft values um, for the four actions that we have described. Um, and we did the 15 test episodes with the 35 time steps in each episode uh, in the real world environment. And then we use causal shaft to explain the six last episodes. So on the slide now, we have the causal shaft values for the first action plotted in a BS Warm plot. Uh, where each of these dots represents one of the time steps in each episode. Uh, and again, the first action, it cor corresponds to a rotation around the shoulder joint. And the features are ordered from top to bottom by the absolute value of, their of the mean shaft value. So we can see here and in the later plots that the two lever uh, variable uh, liver states are some of the most important states, which makes sense uh, because without this, it would be impossible to solve the task. Like without the theta target, the agent would, could not know where to manipulate the lever to. And without the theta lever, the agent would not know where the lever is currently positioned. And it would not even know if it has accomplished this goal of uh, making these two equal. Um, and here we have the beast form plot for uh, action two, which is the rotation about the elbow joint. And we can see here that for many states, uh, the actual shaft values are separated fairly well by their feature values. For instance, in DZ and DX, which are the horizontal and vertical distances from the end effector to the lever, the shaft values are more negative for uh, high feature values. And then there is a gradual transition to more positive shaft values for lower feature values. So you can see that they're on the left for negative shaft values, they are red, which correspond to high feature values. And then it goes uh, and becomes more purple and then blue. And uh, similar tendencies can also be seen for the uh, joint variables, which are Q1 to Q4. Uh, however, maybe it's more clear in this plot for DZ and DX. And here we have action three, which corresponds to rotation about the uh, wrist joint. And we can see here what we saw in two previous plots with the two lever variables being at the top and the shaft values being uh, separated by the feature values. And uh, this separation could be because of the way that the agent operates on this task in that it seems like the operation is separated into two phases with the first phase being when the um, end effector, that is the gripper, of the uh, manipulator and it's, it's moved towards the lever. And then the second phase being that it either pushes or pulls the lever to the correct, uh, uh, the goal lever angle. And finally, we have action four, which corresponds to whether the gripper should be opened or closed. And uh, here we can also see the same as in the uh, previous plots. However, maybe the separation we have talked about uh, is even more clear here 
than in the other plots, like here. Yeah. And uh, now we will examine the shaft values from a more local perspective. Uh, I will show you two video clips. Uh, the first being when the manipulator is pushing the lever, and the second when the mani manipulator is pulling the lever. And after showing each clip, we will briefly examine some interesting aspects uh, of the shaft values around the moment when the man manipulator uh, starts to push or pull the lever. So here is the clip of the manipulator pushing the lever. And uh, here are the shaft values for each action, and they are ordered from left to right and the top to bottom. So uh, here is action one, action two, action three, action four. And then I've got uh, three time steps. And uh, the blue features are features with negative shaft value. Uh, so that is features that are pushing the action towards being more negative. And the red features are features that have positive shaft values and are pushing the action towards being more positive. And here we can generally see again that the lever variables are the most important ones. And we can also see that the current lever angle state is increasing its magnitude, like here. It's, it's uh, getting wider as, uh, as the uh, manipulator is pushing the lever towards the goal angle. So maybe that. This means that for at least some of the actions, this feature is used to cancel out the other features contribution as the task is getting accomplished. And here is the clip of the manipulator pulling uh, the lever. And uh, here we can see, for instance, for action four, here in the bottom right, that most of the features have uh, negative shaft values, which indicates that uh, many of the current uh, feature values is are telling the agent that it should not let go of the lever yet, since if this action had a positive value, the gripper would open. So. Uh, and then it would uh, lose uh, lose the lever. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, one of the drawbacks with the implementations based on SHAP is that they usually take a long time to calculate the feature attributions. And uh, this is also true for causal SHAP, uh, which means that it is not feasible to use uh, causal SHAP in real time applications. However, Wilde uh, will now show us another method which can be used in real time. Uh, my name is Wilde and I'll be talking about linear model trees or LMTs for short. Uh, LMTs are a specific type of decision tree. So if you don't know what the decision tree is, think of it as a flow chart, except that it's made by a machine learning process and not experts. Um, decision tree consists of branch nodes and, and leaf nodes. Uh, the branch nodes are nodes in the tree that has children nodes and they contain a splitting criteria. For example, typically like is feature X uh, smaller than a certain threshold? If yes, go to the left child node. Uh, if not, go to the right child node. And this, uh, all the branch nodes and their splitting criteria together in the structure of the tree uh, splits the input space into different regions. And for every region um, that the tree has split the input space into, there is a leaf node. A leaf node is a node without any children and they contain a prediction function. Uh, typically, this is, for example, for classification and regression trees. This is a constant prediction, either a class or a number. But for linear model trees, we fit a linear function to each leaf node. And, and it's then fit to all the data samples that corresponds to the, uh, belongs to the region for that leaf node. 
Um, and then the LMPs becomes a piecewise linear function. Um, so before I, I tell you how we use these LMTs to explain anything, I want to introduce the problem and the model to be explained. Um, docking is the process of parking a vessel along a certain point along the quay, which we call the, is called the birthing point. Um, and we have a deep neural network that is trained by a reinforcement learning algorithm that performs docking. It was trained by Ella Louise Rurvik, uh, and it, it, uh, it, it does this quite well. It's really good. Um, however, say that you were to go on a boat and the captain say, okay, sure, I don't have a license, but just trust me, I definitely know how to drive a boat. Um, I don't know about you, but I would be concerned. And right now that's all we get from the agent or the neural network. We just have to believe it, that it works well. Uh, we can't guarantee anything. Uh, so this is where XAI comes in. Um, so as Cinder mentioned, uh, one of the main advantages of LMTs are that they are fast enough to be used in real time for robotic applications. And, and this isn't the case for most XAI methods, so it's really important. Uh, additionally, LMTs and decision trees in general are considered to be transparent, which is the opposite of a black box, which neural networks are, uh, because their structure is very intuitive for humans. It's easy for us to follow how it uh, thinks. Uh, the way we use LMTs here make makes it a model agnostic method, meaning it can explain any type of model. It, it doesn't care if it's a neural network or uh, whatever else. Um, but how do we use LMTs as an explanation method? We start by sampling input features or states from the environment, then run it through the DNN and get its actions and make a data set of this, uh, which the LMT can be built upon. So the LMT is built in a supervised learning manner. Um, and then the LMT approximate the model. So ideally, they will be identical, just structured differently. Um, this is not, of course, the case in practice, but, um, but that's the, the idea. And then the uh, DNN or the model, it, it gets its it states from the vessel and predicts the actions and directly controls the vessel. Uh, and the LMT also receives states from the vessel and runs in parallel at the same time and calculates feature attributions, which is the same that uh, SHAP gives. Um, and it, it calculates this through the linear functions in the leaf nodes, uh, the activated leaf node for that sample. Um, and then we combine the vessel states, the DNNs, actions and the LMT's feature attributions to form explanations. Uh, however, how meaningful an explanation is uh, depends on the receiver of the said explanation. Uh, different end users want different types of explanations. Um, and for this uh, work, we have focused on two end users mainly, uh, the developer and the captain. So to the left, you can see the developer with the, the glasses and to the right, the captain with the, uh, well, the, the captain hat. <laughs> um, so one of the difference between them is that the developer works in a stress-free environment with no risks associated. Of course, you can discuss how stress-free it is to be a developer, but for this context, uh, it is. Uh, While well, the captain has, a lot more stress and risks associated, like the risk for herself, the vessel, equipment, and crew. Um, and also the developer has no time pressure, can use all the time in the world to analyze the data, uh, while the captain has to process all the information in real time. Um, and also the, the captain has a lot of other information uh, from other systems on the vessel, from her own senses like sight and hearing and all that. So there's a risk of having an information overload. Uh, the developer also is interested in, in observing edge cases, 
uh, so that to know more about the model, how does it behave in situations it hasn't seen before. Uh, but the captain doesn't want this at all uh, because she wants to avoid any potentially dangerous situations or anything that could lead easily to a, a dangerous situations. Uh, additionally, they have very different background knowledge. Um, so with these uh, characteristics in mind, we suggest two different ways of uh, communicating the information we have about uh, the vessel or two different visualizations of it. Um, so here is the visualization we suggest for the captain. Um, on the top left, uh, you can see the vessel from the vessel's point of view. Uh, it has five actions we can control it with. It's the tunnel thruster at the front uh, of the boat, which we can control the force of. And then we have the two azimuth thrusters at the back, which we can control both the force and angle. Um, the red line indicates where the closest point of the closest obstacle is, and the green line uh, tells us where the burning point is. Additionally, we plot the total force in moment, uh, the actions affect the vessel with. Um, so also the vessel has nine input features, and this is a lot uh, to take in mind, like at the same time, especially for a captain that has a lot of others. So we have compressed the features a bit. For example, all features relating to the obstacle is compressed to one obstacle feature. We use the word feature importance instead of feature attributions because feature attribution is more of a typical developer word. Um, and to the right, you can see how the vessel is situated in, in the harbor. It's a simulated environment based on Stormy Harbor. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is the explanation we suggest for the developer. It is uh, a lot of information. We don't compress anything. And it takes a lot of time to analyze and you have to go through it step by step. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of that with you now, but I'm going to say the main lines of it. So at the top here, this is the states uh, from the vessel. And in the mid, we have the actions. And the shaded area is the difference uh, between what the DNN predicted and what the LMT predicted. So um, the bigger the shaded area is, that means they, the LMT has approximated the DNN um, forward here. And then this should be taken into account when evaluating the feature attributions. And at the bottom, we have the feature attributions. So here's a lot because there are five actions and nine, nine inputs. Um, one interesting thing to note is if you see around here in the mid of the the mid plot, there actually are no feature attributions. And this is because at this leaf node, uh, there is a constant prediction. Um, and then we can calculate the feature attributions. Uh, and this is, we only use the linear functions to calculate the feature attributions, but we should also include like the structure of the tree to get um, even more information out of it. Um, as more of an overview of what you've seen from not only this episode, but also others are that uh, in the beginning, the agent cares a lot about getting closer to the burning points. Uh, so the distance to the burning points are the most, often the most important features. And as it gets closer to the burning point, it also gets very close to the harbor, uh, which is an obstacle. Uh, so then it becomes a lot more aware of not crashing into the, to the harbor. Um, okay, um, yeah. PPO here is the DNN. Um, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, like ideally we want the LMT and the DNN to be identical, but just structured differently, um, but they are not. And if the LMT is, hasn't approximated the DNN uh, good, then the explanations aren't worth anything because the LMTs are most importantly explaining themselves. So we need to know that it has approximated the DNN well. Um, so to evaluate this, we looked at the output errors, how different they are, uh, how different the paths are 
uh, when the LMT is controlling the vessel compared to the DNN. And here I've included one plot of the rewards they received from the same, starting from the same uh, starting point and trying to park the vessel. Uh, this is the reward function used when training the neural network. And as we can see, the LMT is receiving very similar rewards. And from the other tests we've seen, the LMT has approximated the neural network quite well, which is good because uh, it leads us to trust the explanations more. Uh, yeah, that was all I had. Thank you for listening. So there's a question here. Do you know of any efforts made for explainability in other AI branches apart from machine learning where black, small, black, bo black box models are common? For example, in heuristic search or optimization? I can definitely say that there, there is activity. There is not as much because the applications of such models hasn't exploded kind of in the same way in decision making. Uh, I mean, I think that's the kind of the main motivation behind uh, XCI methods for machine learning is that suddenly these models kind of exploded and started making decisions for us, um, while optimization, for instance, has been, has been more common for a longer time. Um, I think the first reference I found to XAI, which is kind of my field in which I am trying to find out how it started, that was in the 80s. Um, where an author, I can't remember his name, but he argued that just because um, a system is kind of explainable and, and traceable and you can tell everything that's going on there, that doesn't mean that it makes sense to a human, right? So it's kind of the same spirit as XAI right now is that you still have to be able to explain it to a human being. Um, and that was a long way of me saying, no, I don't <laughs> know any specific word because work on that because I've, uh, I've just, uh, worked on machine learning, but kind of send me an email because I think this is interesting uh, regardless. I don't know, Tassos, if you want to add to that. At least in the areas where I've been working on, usually we go back to these methods to get to get some transparency. We don't consider them that, but th th there has been work around case-based reasoning, for instance, and explainable AI, I know that. And Kerstin Bach, who is affiliated to our department, I'm sure she can say a lot about it. I don't know if she's, uh, she's present. Uh, I, I don't know these areas in uh, in detail, but there there has been. But comparatively, I should say, from from our my search of the literature, the, it's 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 very imbalanced at the moment. Every, all the um, focus is on uh, machine learning, and uh, I, I would be interested to to hear also what you mean by heuristic search, because I use such methods in AI planning for mission planning of autonomous vehicles, and usually there we have model based versions of the world and some kind of heuristic search, like uh, some kind of A star with some heuristics and we don't see significant ex explainability problems there, at least for our applications, but I'm sure you have something in mind which, which requires explanation. So let's see. Uh, we have one more here from Spiridon. Uh, thank you very much for the great presentations. Is there any particular reason or property in considering linear, function, linear functions at the leaf nodes of the LMTs, maybe this is for Wilde. Could we achieve better explanations with other functional forms? Okay. Uh, yes, good question. Um, one of the main reasons is that it is very easy to get the feature attributions out from the linear functions. And um, we could uh, achieve, or I know it's been used polynomial functions in the leaf nodes, but one of the problems is that the, uh, the time it takes to build a tree increases a lot. So even though they are fast enough to run in real time, it's still, uh, it's not super fast to build them. So if, when you add polynomial functions in the leaf nodes, they are very slow to build. Um, yeah, but you could have any type of model in the, in the leaf nodes, uh, but you also lose a, a transparency if you have too much or too, too difficult models. For example, you can have small neural networks in each leaf node, but then you lose the transparency. Hmm. Very good. I, I've, I have a sort of a more high level question. Working on explainable AI, it seems to me that, that one of the challenges is that it's, and, and you touched on it, Inga, it's, it's hard to measure the quality of explanations. 
so how 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 and the way I understood what you said, Wilde, about you comparing the output from the LNT and the DNN, right? So that's kind of how you quantify um, the quality of your method. Could you could you say a few words about how you know how do you work around that challenge, not being able to necessarily measure the quality of your explanations? Yeah, uh, that's a, a big uh, question. That's hard to to answer, but. Uh, since we can't guarantee or say that they are this or like such or say like to what degree how similar they are um we have all we try to analyze it as in in many ways both by uh analyze the error outputs or like the output the error of between the outputs of the two models and uh, since the lmts uh, predicts actions in, in theory, if it is good enough, it can replace the neural network. And then you won't have to deal with the question of, are the explanations valid? Because they are, because then it's the LMT controlling. Um, but that's, then you have to uh, evaluate the LMT in the same way as you would with the neural network. Um, yeah, I, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, well, that was a good, good, good uh, answer. Thanks. Uh, okay, one final question. We have one question here from uh, Robin B in the chat, uh, asking for ideas on the use of hybrid systems, for instance, neural networks and the fuzzy logic. Um, I, I don't know if a solution in particular, but I think it depends on how you merge those methods and for what. Uh, some people, um, you know, they use model-based methods for the stuff we know and we can model, and then they use the neural network for the stuff that cannot be modeled, for instance. So in that case, the explanations you get, uh, they, they are at the different, you know, you have different requirements. So depending on what kind of hierarchy you're, you're talking, what is the application? And uh, from those elements you put together, the one that is the most black box, what is exactly doing in, in that context? Uh, I think it's important, but I, I don't have a ready answer about this particular combination. Very well. Um, we have actually come to an end. It's a Friday afternoon. Um, thanks for, I have to say, a very, a very good webinar, uh, very um, uh, packed with lots of information for speaking, for people speaking at. Uh, at a high rate, <laughs> so that was great. Uh, so th thanks, thanks to all four of you, and also thanks, of course, to all of you in the audience. Have a nice Friday afternoon and a nice weekend coming up. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye.